Welcome to those who have found us on the internet. This is a service of worship in East Minnesota Church in Belleville, Ontario, the first Sunday of March in 2013. Uh, to, today our church family has been celebrating its anniversary. We've also been listening to some scripture which uh, doesn't sound too, um, too much like a party, uh, including these words from that uh, parable that Jesus gave so long ago. If the tree bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, chop her down. Let's pray. We ask, O oh God, that on this occasion, and for whatever we have brought to this place of our own personal questions, longings, cares, concerns, we pray, O oh God, your grace, so that as we reflect on these words of ancient text, they will come alive for us and speak to us today a message of good news for us today. Amen. So, what better way to celebrate our church's anniversary than to reflect on the wrath of God? It doesn't sound like the stuff of a birthday party, but, but that's what the gospel lesson specified for this day obliges us to do. And I can tell you it's also a subject that comes up again and again in conversations with members of our church family. A few minutes ago we were reminded of the words of Jesus by which he gave this warning that unless we repent we will suffer as badly as those who were slaughtered by Roman brutality or those who had a building fall on them. And then, as if to reinforce the message, we just heard the, the powerfully uplifting but equally troubling words of that song by Rich Mullins, including these. Our God is an awesome God. There's thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fists. The Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. Judgment and wrath he poured out on Sodom. Our God is an awesome God. God. Happy birthday to you too. <laughs> now when the young folks use that word today, the word awesome, they mean something pleasing, welcome, and otherwise good. There's nothing pleasing about a God who wreaks judgmental havoc with punishing consequence, but the awesome God described in the Bible, and especially in the Hebrew Scriptures, does just that. In generation after generation, people of faith assumed that the divine wrath, which once obliterated humankind, save for Noah and his family, was experienced again and again in microcosm in every instance of human suffering. If there was sickness or any other hardship, it was assumed that the sufferer had done or failed to do something to deserve it. This image of God's awesomeness begs the question, how many more chances do we get? Of course, there's also in Scripture another depiction of God's character and personality. In a few moments, we're going to be listening to another contemporary song for worship, this one written by John Thompson. And it's another tribute to the awesomeness of God, the title, El Shaddai, is an ancient uh, Hebrew name for God, usually translated Almighty God. But this song describes how the awesome power of God is experienced, not in punishing wrath, but in helping saving grace. El Shaddai, God Almighty, age to age you're still the same. Through your love and through the ram you save the Son. Of Abraham. Through the power of your hand, you turn the sea into dry land. To the outcast on her knees, you were the God who really sees, and by your might, you set your children free. So, which view of God is correct? Is there a divine presence which continually judges us according to how well we have obeyed the commandments and directives we've been given? Is God waiting to let loose the punishing wrath which you and I, by our disobedience, deserve? Or are we instead held tight in the warm embrace of a heavenly Father whose love is constant, unconditional, and ever ready to forgive? Are we running out of chances? Or is there no limit to the chances we are given? 
Now, Jesus would have known that, that, that these same questions would have been in the minds of his audience that day. They had just brought him information about the brutal tactics being used by the Roman soldiers to beat down, break down, and keep down the people of Galilee. Some had come up with the bright idea that they could combine violence and desecration by attacking Jews in the act of worship so that their blood would be mixed with the blood of the animals which they were ritually sacrificing. For Jews who had long been conditioned to expect God's judging wrath, there was an obvious question, so Jesus asked it. Do, the, do you think that these Galileans suffered like that because they deserved it, because they were worse than the others? And then he answered his own question, no. But unless you repent, the same will happen to you. And then Jesus reminded them of another instance of terrible suffering. The death of 18 people who were crushed following the collapse of the Tower of Siloam in South Jerusalem. This is the only mention of the incident in scripture, so we don't have any information about the cause, but, but scholars tend to assume that it, it had been a tragic accident. Jesus said, do you think that those 18 deserve to be killed more than anyone else who lives in that part of the city? And again, he answered the question. No, he said. But unless you repent, you're all going to die the same way. Since you and I are bound to take seriously the testimony of Scripture, we have a dilemma. Jesus, who is for us the proof and symbol of God's saving love, seems here to be perpetuating the Hebrew concept of a divine judgment and God's punishing wrath. And it's not just here. According to the record, Jesus gave warning after warning that those who do not comply with God's expectations and commandments will suffer dire consequence. The rich man burned in hell because he ignored the needs of, of poor Lazarus at his door. Matthew quotes Jesus as saying that, that in the final judgment, God will separate, like sheep from goats, those who meet the requirements of justice and mercy from those who do not. The righteous will be given eternal life, while the others will, quote, go away to eternal punishment. We're left with the challenge of reconciling for ourselves the threat of cause and effect judgment with what we believe and what the church preaches about the love of God. The first thing we can do is to separate the experiential from the hypothetical. What happens in this life from what we can only guess about the next. Based on what seems to be the evidence of lived experience, I think that we can all agree that there are, in this life, definite patterns of cause and effect predictability which have absolutely nothing to do with the wrath of God. The Galilean worshippers who died at the hands of brutal Roman soldiers were no more guilty than the 26 children and staff who were slaughtered last December in Newtown, Connecticut, Sandy Hook Elementary School. None of them deserved what happened, but there was still a cause and effect predictability in that tragedy because it was the result of certain definable and changeable causes. As the gun control debate rages on, so politicized that there is little hope of positive outcome, there is no reasonable argument against the fact that American gun culture allows unprecedented and mostly uncontrolled access to weapons whose only purpose is to kill people. And in Connecticut, as in Belleville and all of our own communities, there are not nearly enough resources committed to the prevention, identification, and treatment of mental illness. Sandy Hook, like too many similar tragedies, was the predictable result of cause and effect factors which had nothing to do with the victims and absolutely nothing to do with divine judgment. Next week's Maclean's Magazine has an excerpt from a new book in which Michael Friscolanti details factors which in retrospect made last summer's mall tragedy in Elliott Lake predictable, if not inevitable. You remember the Algo Center's roof collapse burying two women under tons of concrete. We can expect to hear more details from the public inquiry which is set to begin tomorrow. 
But here are a few of the cause and effect factors that are already known. The original architect on the project to build the mall, James Kewen, never wanted to put a rooftop parking lot over retail stores. And he repeatedly expressed his, his concerns, his safety concerns to the developer, but was ignored. The engineer who oversaw the structural design of the mall, one John Cadlick, later botched so many other projects that the professional engineers of Ontario not only revoked his license, it warned owners of other projects he had supervised, including the Algo Center, to double check his work. And the mall had been inspected just 10 weeks before the collapse. But the engineering firm hired to do the inspection, M.R. Wright and Associates, was itself a disaster. Its president had his license suspended five months earlier for professional misconduct on another project. Other contributing factors are suggested in that McLean's investigation and will doubtless be examined in the inquiry. You see, there is a pattern of cause and effect predictability. This tragedy did not just happen due to cosmic serendipity, but neither was it the result of any wrongdoing by Lucy Alwyn or Dolores Perizzolo, the two women who died. Their suffering had nothing to do with divine judgment. We also know from experience that patterns of cause and effect predictability can result in suffering that, well, I guess in, in retrospect, is deserved. Here's a recent example that hits close to home for, for many of us and many of the families who aren't here today because they're off at, at hockey games. Two weeks ago, during a hockey game in Port Perry between seven and eight-year-olds, several parents were unhappy with the officiating by the referee who was himself a 17-year-old kid. After the game, a group of angry parents confronted the teenager in the parking lot. One of those parents, Brad Fenney, threatened the boy and then kicked him in the legs from behind. This past Tuesday, Durham Regional Police arrested Fenney and charged him with assault. Now, that's a terrible outcome for Fenny. His reputation is ruined. A conviction could cause considerable lasting hardship. But in this case, whatever the effect, he is himself the cause. The bad things that happen to us are often the predictable cause and effect result of poor choices, bad behavior, and other factors for which we are ourselves completely responsible. The drunk driver is not allowed to claim reduced culpability because alcohol made him less capable because he is responsible for his decision to drink and drive in the first place. And the victims of that drunk bear no responsibility for the outcome though they themselves may end up bearing the greater consequences of suffering. We know from experience, too much experience, that in this life there are myriad patterns of cause and effect predictability, but there is no positive correlation between suffering and deserving. In this life there is no evidence nor reason to believe that God is pulling strings of reward and punishment. I may be running out of chances to avoid the heart attack, the, the, the reprimand at work, the marriage breakdown, the speeding ticket, any number of hardships, not because God finally gets around to punishing me, but because I have made bad choices for which those hardships are the predictable result. That about the experiential. But what about the hypothetical? What do we believe about what happens after this life? Should we expect and therefore fear that we will come face to face with the punishing wrath of a, of a judging God? We just don't know. We don't know. What we do know is that God is not finished with us yet, and God has definitely not given up on us yet. After Jesus gave those calls to repentance, he told a story. He said there was a landowner who had lost patience with one of his fig trees. It refused to bear fruit. After three years, still no fruit. And what good is a fruit tree that produces no fruit? 
When another season brought no results, he told his gardener to get rid of the thing, to chop it down, dig out the roots, get rid of it completely. The tree, he said, was a waste of good soil. The gardener agreed, but suggested to his boss that the tree be given another chance. Let me loosen the soil around its roots and, and give it a good dose of fertilizer, he said, and then if it bears no fruit next year, well then we can get rid of it. Isn't it interesting that Jesus followed his warning about cause and effect consequence with the story of a tree that was given another chance? Seems to me the message here is hope. The promise of hope did not originate with Jesus. Uh, we, we, we Christians like to give the Hebrew Scriptures a bad rap, but in the Hebrew Scriptures, for instance, in the book of Jonah, there is a message of hope. Jonah describes how a whole nation had earned the judging wrath of God and had completely run out of chances. Jonah was chosen to take that message to the people of Nineveh. You can see where Nineveh would be situated today within uh, what we know of as Iraq. And to tell the people of Nineveh that they would be destroyed, that they would be completely obliterated by God, who would no longer tolerate their disobedience. What is best known about Jonah, of course, is how fearing for his life, he tried to avoid his mission by trying unsuccessfully to run away from God. But the best part, the best part of the story is how it ends. When Jonah finally announced to the people that their time was up, that God was about to wreak on them a havoc of punishment, the king of Nineveh commanded everybody to stop their bad behavior and wait for their punishment in pious repentance. And what follows is, in my opinion, one of the most awesomely hope-filled verses in the whole of Scripture. When God saw what they did, how they turned away from their evil ways, God relented and did not bring on them the destruction which they deserved. The Ninevans had used up all their chances, and still, because they were finally willing to do what was right, they were given another chance. So how many more chances do we get? Who knows? We do know that there are cause and effect, there is patterns of cause and effect predictability which have nothing to do with divine judgment or God's punishing wrath. There is cause and effect predictability on the personal level. If I keep banging my head against the wall, I am going to get a headache. There is cause and effect predictability for churches. If the people of Eastminster choose not to honor the heritage we celebrate today by continuing to seek and claim new opportunities for faithful discipleship, then this church will not and should not survive. And there is cause and effect predictability at every level of human experience. How many more chances do we get to avoid the predictable consequences of economic injustice, mass starvation, nuclear proliferation, global warming? Who knows? But we do know this. We know that like the fig tree, which had so far been a waste of soil, we have been given another chance. We have been given by the grace of God this wonderful, wonderful day. We have been embraced by a divine love which is from everlasting to everlasting. And that love revealed and proven in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, that love is our hope. We have been given another chance. Let's not waste it. Amen.